Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, so welcome back to my little um, my little cell. Uh, we're back in my little cell from my uh, quick jolly jaunt across to Denmark uh, the other day. So uh, welcome to another hour of editing with Capture One. So that software there, um, that logo, if you don't know what that logo stands for or what application it is, Capture One is a raw processor, so it takes your raw data out of your camera and it effectively allows you to process and edit uh, that data into your final finished image. And that's what we're going to do uh, for an hour this afternoon or this morning or this evening, depending on where you're, uh, where you're watching from, including Alan, who's still up in Australia. Well done. Um, so we're going to start today um, just covering um, the version update that actually happened with Capture One the other day. So it was last... Ooh, when was it? Last Thursday, I think. Um, Capture One was updated to version 14.3. So we'll call it 21.3 or 21 version 14.3 or the third iteration of, of version 21, whatever you want to call it. Um, that went out as a new release. And in that version were a few updates. So number one, Magic Brush. Uh, Magic Brush is something that we'll probably get to use a lot more over the, uh, over the coming months and years. Um, but effectively, it's a more intelligent brush, a more intelligent way of masking objects uh, around um, your image, rather than using the existing tools that we had, which were Luma Range, Color Range, uh, and obviously the, the normal brush and, and gradient filters. It doesn't mean that you can only now use Magic Brush from now on, but it's another tool in that toolbox. The Universal Exporter... Um, Hopefully, uh, it's going to make a little bit of sense um, in a second. Um, we'll come back to this. Actually, we'll have the, we'll have the chat about the exporter. Um, the catalog subfolders is a big one for a lot of people. It allows us to be able to actually see within catalogs and subcatalogs and oh, sorry, within folders within catalogs. So we can see the numbers of images within subfolders, which we weren't able to do before when it's cascaded up to the top. So if I had 100 images in five different subfolders, now my top level folder will say 500, whereas it didn't um, prior. There's some other stuff um, for Leica users, so it allows nudging of focus um, when you're tethered. Fuji has got an upgrade where you can now trigger the shutter, believe it or not, while in live view, because that was a bug before, or it was a feature that wasn't there before, and some other stuff. Um, but effectively, where I'm um, coming from with the Universal Exporter is a slightly different place to others. Um, and I know a few people have had a little bit of a problem um, with some of the changes to workflow as a result of introducing the exporter. So let's go into Capture One. Um, so this first shot is Chris's shot. We'll, we'll be editing this in a minute. Um, but this shot itself, uh, let, let's imagine I wanted to export uh, this and this variant, so these two together. Um, Let's imagine then I go to my export tool, which has actually moved. So we don't have the tab here anymore. We have the export tool instead. And this is going to be very familiar to a lot of people that use uh, the importer tool or the, uh, the, the, um, the way that we bring images into catalogs in the first place with our sort of film strip on the right hand side. And now the process recipes are here. And they're giving us live previews of that proofing um, of that recipe. Now, to me personally, this is actually a marked improvement. Um, this allows me to keep control over lots of different um, aspects. So the different images that I'm exporting and, and being able to quickly soft proof, but all within one window. But also it's got rid of some of the clutter that was there before. And the way that I work is typically we'll work on an image and then export at the end. Now to other users, some users, that had a workflow that included the export tool up here in a tab, so it used to sit up here, so next to the style tab you had the info tab and then there was another little cog wheel which was the process recipe um, tab or the processing tab. And to a lot of people that were working in studios and so on, they would built a workflow around that tool. And this is where I, I sort of struggle with some of the um, the, uh, let's say, attacks <laughs> um, on the developers that have happened over the last week. And those attacks have been focused on the fact that to certain people, their workflow has been hit as a result of the change to the universal tool. Now, I'm going to be quite harsh here. 
which is it's not your personal software. Um, in the same way that some people will use Microsoft Word to write a letter once in a blue moon, and they want an easy way of doing that. Other people will use it to write a novel. Some people might choose to use Microsoft Word to document the formulas required to, I don't know, send a spaceship to the moon. Um, but you're all using the same tool, and the developers have to weigh up what's right for the bulk of people, bulk of, of users that are using it, while also accommodating where they can for the extremes. So there are people in Capture One that want to use a single button um, to click the, the button and it automatically do everything. And then you've got other people in Capture One that are using it for e-commerce shots, so high volume, high speed um, image um, production. You've got other people that are using it, like me, I, I use it remotely out in the, out in the field. And to each of those people, there will be things that we like and things that we don't like in a generic piece of software, which is what this is. Capture One is the same as other pieces of software. They're written for multiple use cases. So ultimately, Capture One is designed to cater for the whole breadth of people, from those that want the push button solution to those that want to hack away behind the screen and or behind the scenes and put Apple script um, uh, engines behind it and whatever to automate things so they're also listening and they're also understanding different workflows different use cases for people different um or different scenarios effectively and some of them they will know very well intricately and some of them they're going to need some some more knowledge of how individuals work but what's not okay and what i'm seeing quite a lot of is literal abuse that's come out of um uh, of the latest update that's not okay that's not cool that's not in in the the ironic word that keeps being used is the pros so the pros are not happy i'm a pro i'm very happy with this piece of software i know lots of pros that are it's not about whether it's pro or amateur that the uh, the magic cogwheel has been taken away it's about your workflow and to some people, that workflow is irrelevant. To some people, it is very important. Constructive feedback is very, very important. It's very, very valuable. It's very, very useful. Stupid abuse and you know, rude language online and stuff like that. Just don't. Just, just turn your computer off if you need to get to that level. Because that's not constructive. It doesn't help the developers. It doesn't help other users. And it's not going to get you the result that you want if you're going to go down that path. So I encourage everyone, please, if a change in a version of software, 14.3, 14.2, 14.0, whatever, um, or 15 or 16 or whatever, doesn't suit what you expected or doesn't suit what you wanted, submit it as a feature request. Genuinely put it in there. For those that don't like the 14.3, stick with 14.2 for now. I don't know what's in the plan for 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and, and whatever, but I do know the developers are listening when they get constructive, useful feedback that gives them something that they can build on. So on this, genuinely, Capture One is as flexible as, as it can be out of all of the raw processes out there. I know because I, I use most of them, um, and it's probably the most fluid but that also means that a lot of people have built workflows that are very specific to them around that particular piece of functionality. And that's great. Please do. It's, it's a great piece of software for that. And sometimes something that gets built will potentially break something else. Well, not break, but either remove in this case as it has or um, has, has altered its functionality in a way that some people love and some people hate. It doesn't mean the people that like it are wrong. It doesn't mean the people that hate it are wrong. It's just we all use the software differently. So please use the feature request. Use the support um, forum, support.captureone.com. Use the bug um, filing system if you want. But put the feedback that you have in positively, constructively. Talk to, you know, literally document what you want in an ideal world. It might not even be the old way of doing it. There might be an even better way that you can think of genuinely put that stuff in um but you know do it in a way that's human and nice because i'm seeing stuff out there that's just rude um and that's that's not what we're about we're supposed to be people that are creative and, and we like seeing things and and exploring the world so let's let's go on that basis rather than the keyboard warriors that i keep seeing out there um instead so there we go um 
that's my view anyway um if, if you don't agree that's okay um but that's certainly where where i come from um now you know if i look at some of you guys um in terms of your your answers so you know uh where are we this one uh cc photography so i wish you could change the order of the sections in the exporter like with tools put it in as a request good idea actually if you could move the the tab stuff around great put it in um, ask for it. If you don't ask for it properly through those channels, no one's going to hear that voice. Um, Jim, you know, I used to have issues um, with multiple images when I only wanted to export an image. Uh, where are we? Uh, Cameron saying they took it away. That's the problem. And, and I, I agree. I've seen that. Um, I've, I've seen people say that their workflow is damaged or, or altered because that, that process recipe um, tab has been taken away. In some ways, to some of those workflows, I don't agree because actually what we're, what a lot of people were talking about is it was on a tab, it was easier. Well, whether it's on a tab or whether it's on a modal dialog, you're still going through the same process of exporting. I know some people have issues with subfolders and subnames. So again, let's let's help the developers to, to hone this in and get it right um, for as many people as we can. Right. Um, on a, on a much more pleasant note, I'm a great fan of the new Magic Brush, says Simon. Cool. Uh, yes, as a lot of people are. Um, so most people have seen the Magic Brush. They understand um, that it is, and it is version one. So there are a couple of things, and we'll go through on here, that Magic Brush doesn't yet do. And I've, I've come across them as well. So Magic Brush is great at... Um, Let's just get rid of our browser a second. Magic Brush is great at adding masks. So Magic Brush is this one here on the left-hand side. As a result of introducing Magic Brush, two things have moved in Capture One's interface. The first is up here, our layer visibility. That's now moved up here on the viewer. The second is the adding and deleting of layers is now up here on the sort of right-hand side above the tools rather than it used to be down here on the left. I'm still getting used to this. I still click in the wrong place every now and then. Um, but Magic Brush is here. And with our Magic Brush, um, we can very quickly, let's create a new layer. Uh, very, very quickly, just say, I want this rock. And Capture One's gonna do some clever stuff and find similar pixels. Great. Let's just keep adding. And I've got some settings in here so I can change its tolerance. I can change whether it looks at the whole image or just the things that are connected to each other. So really good stuff. Um, but I don't have a magic eraser, for example. Hopefully that'll come in um, at, at some point in the future. And yes, we'll put in feature requests to ask for it. But at the moment, if you want to erase from Magic Brush, you've got to use the standard eraser here. So if, for example, here I wanted to get rid of this hut, it's not quite so magic um, yet. So we've, we've got, a, there's a few things that, that hopefully will improve over time. But as a version one of Magic Brush, uh, most people seem to have the same sentiment, which is this is a big move forward, and it is. Um, it has absolutely improved the way that people mask. Um, and it's a, it's a great first step into hopefully a lot more intelligent masking going forward, building on the existing masks like luma ranges like gradients and and so on so hopefully that keeps growing um in this case for for this image this is chris's shot i i don't know where the location is but this is a very very cool um very cool view um and the question was um from chris you know have i brought up enough in terms of detail and shadows and and have i overdone the sky i think one of the questions was so here's our before. So if you want before and after, click up here on the toolbar or press the Y key on your keyboard. Uh, you can choose to have it split screen and we can go left and we can go right and we can see what was before on the left and what the result is of Chris's edits. And there's a couple of things in here that are actually a little counterintuitive from what I can see um, that have been done. So we're just going to cover those. The first issue that there is on this shot, Chris, if I'm honest, is it's so dark. Um, I actually printed a quick version just to, I just wanted to check in my own head um, that I wasn't missing something. When printed, the density of this shot is really heavy. It's just so dark everywhere. And even with um, some of these details in here, it's just pretty much lost the second a printer starts laying down any um, black ink or heavy, um, heavy tones. So, to me, if this is intending to be printed, um, you're going to need to lift it up a little bit, and we'll we'll do that in a second. Um, let's have a little uh, look at the some of the stuff that we can do, and actually some of the contradictions. So, 
Our background has, hasn't been touched. What Chris has done very well um, is put all of the base adjustments in a layer so we can obviously reduce and increase or increase those changes using the opacity slider on the layer. So it means that we're not stuck with all of these background things that we can't undo. We have to do them one by one. So doing your base adjustments on a layer can be a really good way of, of saving some time. With that done, however, so in here we've got an exposure lift of 0.6. And if I press M for the mask, we can see that's across the whole image. So we've lifted the exposure by 0.6. There's also a little bit of uh, dodging and, and brightening on there. But then on the sky, we've got minus 1.3 on our exposure. But if I do the mask um, again and bring that up, the sky hasn't just included the sky. It's also included these rocks. And here's where I get a bit confused because it's brought down the highlights, it's brought down the exposure, it's brought down brightness, and that was obviously designed around the sky. But it's also, through this Luma range, included some of the rock. So then what Chris has done is had a separate um, layer here called Shadow Detail, which lifts up the shadows by 1.23. So you can see how we, we start to get into this seesaw place. So we've got a, a base exposure, which is lifted by 0.6. And then when it comes to these top rocks here, because they're included in both this layer and this layer, so not only the shadow detail layer, but also the sky layer, unfortunately, we're, we're countering all those changes. So we're bringing them down by 1.3. Well, we're bringing them up by 1.2. We've got some other details that we've brought up as well by 1.23 on the rock down here. Uh, there's, oh, no, sorry, that's a, uh, that's a stamp tool but there was another one somewhere yeah there we go we've got a, a brightening layer so a, a dodge layer over the same elements and we talk about it um quite a lot um that try and be careful that you're not editing the same pixel backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards all the time it's the same with things like highlights and um shadows and stuff like that you know we bring up the highlights on one layer and then we bring down them on or bring them down on the next that doesn't make sense and we're introducing changes to the raw data that aren't necessary and there's a golden rule which is don't do any adjustment that's not needed so only do the adjustments that are essential to get to the place that you want to be so in this particular shot here um let's have a little look let's go into our sky layer first and i'm just going to use a very simple eraser so nothing nothing too smart in fact what i'm going to do just quickly is bring up uh, our browser and clone the variant so i've got a copy of it so i'm editing this copy rather than chris's original here so we can compare so on this one i'm going to make sure our opacity is up to 100 um, flow can be 100 for this that's fine nice soft brush small ish edge and I'm just going to take out, or try to take out. That's very odd, isn't it? <laughs> We've got a fixed mask. Literally can't get rid of that mask. How strange. Let's take off our airbrush as well. No, how very strange. Okay, so instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to clear this mask. And we're going to, we wanted to apply that to the sky, right? So let's use our magic brush. Well, we can't fix the Luma range for some reason. Not sure why. Have a little bit of a play with that later. So I want to select the sky. I've used the magic brush. It's done a pretty good job. Let's just make sure that we don't have any issues around the rocks. We don't. It's done a good job there. So my new mask around the sky has done exactly what I wanted it to there. It's maybe missed these bits in here. So what I'm going to do is just add a bit more into here and a bit more into here. And we get to a pretty good place with sort of three clicks with Magic Brush. Great. I don't want it to be quite that heavy. So I'm just going to pull back that opacity. So again, this is a reason for doing it on layers. It means that whatever effect I do on the layer, I can back it away. But if you think about going back to the magic brush argument, how easy was that? And, and actually what Chris had done before was a Luma range. For some reason it's locked, but we'll try and work that out later. Um, there's a lot of tweaking that you have to do with those Luma ranges um, to get them right. And still you saw, you know, you're still picking up these rocks. With the magic brush, quick little draw over and it's got the sky. If we wanted to add to it, we can very quickly. And I've got a very, very good mask. In fact, let's just have a look at the grayscale mask for it. 
that's a complex mask. You know, that, that really is. Um, and it's drawn it with pretty much spot on accuracy in three clicks. So I'm pretty happy with the, with the, the magic brush as it stands right now. It's saving time already. But what we've now got is that sky layer, which has the lowered exposure, the lowered brightness, the lowered highlights and so on, only applying to the sky. So if I look at the comparison now between the original here and the new version, we can see we're in a better place on the rock. We need to do a little bit of work down here to blend these in. So I'm going to go to my eraser. Hopefully it'll work this time. Um, much bigger eraser. In fact, we'll use a low flow version on this one. And we're just going to blend in manually these edges because what I don't want is this darkening happening down here out into these hills. So that's adding quite nicely there. And if we look from here, the original, to here, we've still got our dark sky, but we've now got more detail in the rock. The shadow detail layer can stay because that's lifting them even more. That's a pretty good call. Um, so we're in a good place um, as a result of just cleaning up that sky layer so it doesn't include the mountains in the first place. Um, yeah, a couple. so a couple of you are saying, you know, is auto mask on to erase that? No. Um, and where are we? Before and after on? That shouldn't affect um, whether or not I can erase. So, yeah, this is very strange. It was a bit weird, but we'll... We'll try and see. We'll try and see what's going on. Um, Jim, good man. There we go. I like the new exporter. So do I. Um, we're, we're we're all good. Um, land. It is interesting from a workflow point of view. Typically, landscape cityscape. Any people that are creating images and then coming back to base will have no problem with the the big exporter or the new exporter. Um, it tends to be in a more um, factory approach um, of a workflow that that tends to uh, have some issues. Okay, so let's have a little look at the rest of this shot because what I did say is we want to bring up some of the, um, the the detail in here. We know that we don't want to affect the sky. That's that's a fact. Um, but we also do need to bring up some of the detail here. So what I'm going to go is into our base adjustment and just pull up all of our exposure to see where we get to. Okay, so there's a lot of detail in here. That's good. First check. Can we can we even pull up the detail without pulling up too much noise? Seems that we can, but we don't want to do it globally. That just loses all of its atmosphere. So let's pull our main exposure back down, and I'm going to create a new layer. Uh, this one we are is actually an empty layer. So this one here, empty layer at the moment, no mask on it. Let's try our magic brush just for fun, and draw over our mountain. Done a pretty good job of getting the tones right. Tolerance, if I start to increase that, it's going to get more of that mix of shadow and, and highlights um, within the same sort of spell. That's pretty nice. Okay. And then with this, I can now use this layer. So we're going to call this Mountain. Remember, you can double click on any um, layer or, or just click again on the layer and you can um, hit the name into there. Or you can press enter um, on the keyboard and you can start typing the name. Do label your layers. It'll help you keep track. So let's, with this one, just pull up a bit of exposure. Not a lot, but then more in brightness. And brightness is just more of a softer pull of exposure. It's not shifting the histogram. It's squashing. We talk about it quite a lot. Um, but I like the effect. It can flatten, but it sort of brings up a little more um, a little more softly than an exposure um, drag, as it were. And with that, I'm actually going to double down. There's already some clarity on another layer, but I'm going to increase some clarity on this layer. And that's kind of it. Um, I'm not going to push it much more. But you will see now when I flip back to the original, there was our original. There's our new one. This is still the main object um, of what we're looking at. And in fact, if I wanted to really make that pop, what I can do is create a new layer and we'll call it, I guess, hut. And we'll create a radial mask. So a nice big circle. Turn my mask on. So press M on the keyboard to get your mask. Now this is the opposite to what I want. So I'm just going to right click and say invert mask. So we've now got a little hot spot. As soft as you can make it this, um, so make basically this small circle as far away from the outer circle as possible. 
that really 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 softens it down and it means that when we do this in a second so pull up again our brightness it doesn't look like we've got a halo around it um, where it's obvious there's a mask and again if i didn't want so much well i can always pull down the um the slider on brightness and so on but effectively even with shadow pull up you'll see here it starts to look a little bit overdone um, so be careful that you're not pulling it up too much if you just pull up shadow and you've got some highlights you'll start seeing some hdr effects which can be a little bit overworked um but yeah overall um that's sort of where i'd pull it you know a tiny amount maybe even only five up on there just to bring this out um as our main subject but i go from there which will print don't get me wrong um but it is really dark um, when you go to do that to here and if i wanted to maybe you know reduce some of the brightness up here on this mountain so here's my mask well i can still go into my, my uh, eraser nice low flow um with a really soft edge and we can paint in some of this top stuff and just drop that down a little bit in terms of brightness gives us a bit more of that atmosphere back but we've got a lot of detail in the rock back that's the key for me we you know it, it's great to have the shadows but this pretty much comes out as black when it's calibrated out um whereas here we've got a lot more information in there if i look at them uh, side by side let's have a little look there um, so hopefully that comes across on your screens but certainly here as i'm looking at it the right hand one we've got a lot more data in um, those shadows displayed the left hand one not so much so that'd be it um but yeah i do want to know where that is because it's a very cool place love it uh so couple where are we question uh, anthony why not do more brightness and less exposure for the mountain um, yeah, it, it's an option. So just bear in mind, um, exposure is, is literally dragging that histogram left and right. So every bit of data turns um, brighter or darker. Brightness is more of a, a squish. Um, and it's, re it, it's prevented from pushing things way overexposed or way underexposed, depending on which direction you go. So it sort of ramps down um, at the edges of the histogram. The effect is that you can end up with a slightly flattened image, let's say, um, as a result of overdoing brightness. So if you use too much of the brightness slider, it, it has the effect of squishing stuff into the middle rather than allowing it to escape to either end. So you can lose effectively some contrast by using the brightness tool alone. So a mix, I genuinely do a mix of exposure and brightness together. Um, you know, brightness for a, a softened um, change in, in tone, exposure for a more um, brutal one, um, just literally sliding it left and right. Um, where are we? Uh, a couple of other ones. So uh, I haven't tried this, but other than the tools to refine the mask created by the Magic Brush, could you incorporate a Luma range with the mask created? Yeah, yeah so this is... <laughs> Uh, one thing, let me just uh, clone this so we don't lose it. Let's go to our mountain range here. You can absolutely apply a Luma range to your Magic Brush mask. The Magic Brush is purely about drawing the mask. Once it's drawn, it makes absolutely no difference to any other type of mask. Um, if I go onto a Magic Brush layer and then draw a gradient, it's going to erase the Magic Brush and put the gradient in instead. I can use a Luma range. I can also still refine the edge here for the whole mask. So Magic Brush has built into its ability to draw this here, Tolerance and Refine Edge. That applies to each brush stroke. So you can have different refine edges, and we, we cover that. If you look at the um, intro video we did for 14.3, you'll see um, that we actually talk about at one image with lots and lots of different refined edges in it. The master changes to the overall mask on the overall layer still apply to a magic brush layer just like any other brush. Um, this is just about the, the cleverness when drawing. It's not about what you can do with it afterwards. So you can invert a magic brush layer, no problem. You can feather it. You can, um, you know, you can apply the Luma range like we just showed. Um, so it is, to all intents and purposes, and in, in actual fact, it is just a mask. Um, it's just a more clever one when we're drawing it in um prasad uh your magic brush questions are probably more detailed we'd probably need um a session maybe with the developers or something to go through exactly what it's doing 
um, behind the scenes. Um, but we'll try and do that. Um, where are we? Jim, I just readjusted my monitor from 160 down to 120 so the images look correct on the web. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one. Um, so obviously we talk about color space quite a lot. Um, so sRGB rather than um, Adobe RGB, maybe. So if, for instance, I go to our export box here, um, quite often for a TIFF, we want to export it as Adobe RGB. It's got a much wider color gamut for printing. Um, but for things like Instagram and, and online on web, you want it in the sRGB color space. A lot of people have shifted to P3 and, and similar, but sRGB is the safe one. But that's talking about the color range. When we talk about brightness, obviously people's monitors are at different brightnesses. Um, the only real guide that you can use on screen is pretty much your histogram. You know, if, if you've got a, an image which has peaks up here in the bright um, parts of the histogram and shadows in the, the darkest parts, you're going to hit uh, what you need for most uh, screens. But obviously, if someone else turns their brightness down on the screen, you know, they're not going to see anything. So that's in their control as much as it is in yours. Um, Jeff, occasionally I have to make a dr more drastic highlight and shadow change to an image. Um, by dr We'll cover it in a second, Jeff. I need a, a different answer to a different question. When you say a drastic highlight and shadow change, do you mean drastically pulling in highlights and pulling up shadows? So in other words, squishing them to the middle? Or do you mean both one direction, both in the other? Um, we'll try and we'll try and get in there um, in a second. Right, uh, let's have a little look uh, at Marco's shot. So we've got some fields coming up in Italy. Yeah. So um, this is, I think you said lentil harvest um, in in Italy. So. Let's have a look at the before and after. The question that Marco had is, is it overdone? Um, so here's our before, here's our after. So I'm going to ask, I'll answer that in two different ways. Um, is it markedly different from the original? Yes, yes it is. It, it is a very different feel, tone uh, approach to the original shot. Is it overdone? I don't know, I don't think so. Um, it's it's very much dehazed, um, but overall, I don't think that's necessarily too bad. I, I I think it's okay. My challenge with this shot actually is nothing to do with the processing. I think the processing is is fine, and and the tools that you've used, you know, you've used the dehaze tool. Um, that's that's fixed a lot of the uh, the issues. I think back in the the background there. Um, but yeah, all of the all of the corrections you've done have been Luma range based, and they you've pulled them up and down in the right ways. Um, it looks like an okay edit. I, there's no issue in that sense, but I'm just tempted to crop it slightly differently. Because when I looked at the wider image up here, to me, the really cool stuff in this, and I get the fields are very important, but these mountains that are sweeping down on the side, they're really, really cool. Um, why would we crop them out? So I'm, and again, this is personal choice rather than anything else, but I'm tempted very much to shift this into a one by two and let's have a little look can we get maybe that much of them in I'm not sure about this line at the bottom here we may have a play with that later so what that leaves us with is this sort of I guess flow into the fields um, but obviously this out here, which is a bit of a problem, um, and this fog layer here with this dehaze had already been done, so Marco's already put that in, um, but yeah, it needs a bit more, let's, let's be honest. Um, so just a couple of, we're going to nip across to comments again, because there are a couple of, um, a couple of uh, different ones. So Jeff, it answers my question, cool. Uh, so drastically opening shadows and saving the highlights, okay. So think about what that does. Um, this is probably an easier image to do it with. So I'm just going to clone this variant just so we can see. And let's reset everything. So here is our original file. And we can see in here that we've got a um, got a, an image with a pretty middle uh, or median um, histogram. If I start pulling in highlights, so you can see the histogram nudge a bit to the left. And pulling in white, it nudges a bit more to the left or to the middle, more accurately. And I pull up shadows. And I pull up blacks. 
what I end up with is one way or another, all of my data squashed into the middle. There's another image that we'll come on to in a, in a bit, um, which we can demonstrate this a bit more. But that's why these sliders are dangerous when used together, because a low contrast image, if you didn't intend it to be, can be really flat. The alternative, of course, is that we actually darken shadows and we darken down the blacks and we bring up the, the very brightest parts, the whites, and also bring up the highlights and we add contrast effectively to the image. So the more we stretch that histogram, so up here on the top left, as that histogram starts to grow towards the edges, we're getting more contrast. As it starts to shrink into the middle, we're getting less contrast. So the more of a pyramid you see in the middle, the flatter the image. And that's the risk of using all of the HDR tools together. If you need to, so let's say you're in a shot where it's sunrise against a you know, very dark foreground, then absolutely pull in the highlights, pull up the shadows to get that dynamic range back from what was in the raw data. But if the image is already flat to start with, be really careful with that approach, because if you do it and overdo it, um, you're going to get into a, a bit of a mess. Um, was the other one sorry uh barry can the names of recipes be changed um for example i duplicate a recipe and make a few changes can i rename the new one so go into your recipe here um just like a layer you can either double click on there or you can hit the enter button so yes if i don't like uh this one i can call this one barry's recipe and now it's saved so yes you can either Choose from the default ones to add, or you can add your own, um, duplicate it, um, whatever, and you can rename the default recipes, no problem. Um, just just like you can a layer. Um, that was an easy one. Cool. Right. Um, so let's... Uh, oh, good question, Roger. Um, with a squished histogram like this, would you not start with levels? Yes. Yeah, so... I was emailing someone earlier about this, actually, funnily enough, about histograms and, and levels and HDR and so on. The levels in the HDR sliders do very different things. Um, so the, the HDR sliders are dealing with the edges of the histogram and they're squishing them in or pulling them out. The levels tool is changing the baseline of the histogram. So the two are connected. But yes, if you had a, an image like this that started, in fact, I should have done a new one, but started like this, and I wanted more contrast, the other place you could go is into our levels tool and say, right, I want to displace all of this data and stretch the histogram out and say, this is now my brightest part, just above the midtones, and this is now my darkest part. The way that I do that is I tell it, this is now my brightest part, this is now my darkest part, and now I'm adding contrast. Just like removing contrast, be careful you don't overdo it. Um, if you overdo it, you end up with this sort of stuff going on. Um, quite often, it's a more efficient way if you don't want the saturation to do it in a luma curve instead of levels. But yes, this is how those two tools sort of interplay, um, where everything on the HDR tools is at the edges of your histogram. The levels is determining effectively where those edges sit. So up to our top left on here. So we have already a fog layer up here. Um, which Marco's already drawn. So I'm going to use it a bit more. And all we're going to do, there is already some dehaze on there. I'm going to recover those highlights in and also recover the white and also pull down a, ooh, maybe not that much. <laughs> I was going to pull down the exposure, but it looks like it's not hitting the top as much as it is the middle. So I'm going to have to draw another extra mask and just call it top uh, highlights with a really, really, really soft um, gradient filter. Push that off the canvas a little bit. It doesn't mind, because I don't want to include these hills here. Of course, I can erase them if we really wanted to later and just pull that exposure down a little bit. And all that's doing is it's getting rid of the distraction of that top bright part. But that's the sort of crop that I'd be on. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with this shot, Marco. Honestly, it, it's a it's a good edit um you know is it different to the original absolutely you can see that but i would say it's sort of been brought a bit more to life it's certainly not as flat as it was before but personally i like this bit um as an extra bit um on there as well okay um 
where are we? Joe's just said there is much more fog in the edited versus the original image in the top left. What caused it? Let's just have a little look. Um, it is pro. Oh, I can probably guess actually what's gone on. Um, somewhere in here. It looked like there was some work to bring up. Yeah, bring up the highlights, which this stuff up here is sitting right on the edge of where highlights starts to disappear. So in bringing those highlights up, you see here it's changing. So there's my brightness there, and there's dark, bright, dark. And it's that change there along with this brightness thing here that's actually introducing some of that brightness at the top, um, I believe. Um, but that one's an easy one to, to pull back um, just with an extra little layer. Um, right, uh, Anthony, have the folks at Capture One Dev team thought of doing a Luma levels? Um, ah, okay, so you mean, uh, yeah, so like the, um, like on the curve. I, I don't know if they have thought of it. Um, put it in. Feature request. Why not? Um, have a... <laughs> Um, see if see if you can get it invoked because you know it didn't used to be that we could do Luma on the curve so yeah Luma on levels maybe that's also a, a, a good move um, to add in not sure but I don't I don't think it's a bad idea um, yeah feature request put it in but yes uh, to where was it Barry's point um, yeah the edit completely changes the way that this image feels so we go from there to there it's that's a that's a big change in that image but I don't think it's, you know, quite often we talk about a big change being a negative thing. I don't think in this case it is. I think it's brought out all the detail. Um, looks pretty good, nice and sharp. We've actually got a lot of um, sort of sharpening effect as a result of bringing up all that structure and clarity as well. So, good. Right, uh, let's go on to, in answer to Jeff's question earlier, I think it was Gilles shot. Here, yes. Um, so this was Leon, I think. Now, um, so perfect um, picture to, to talk through Jeff's question, actually, uh, which is, let's go into our pop the image and HDR level. So these are, uh, I think it's Jill. It's not Giles, hopefully. Um, so these are Jill's changes um, that you're seeing on the screen. Here is the original. And you'll see that we've introduced a huge amount more detail for sure. But it's also done that flattening thing. And if we look at why, so we've got the highlights pulled down, the shadows pulled up, the whites pulled down, the blacks pulled up. Effectively taking all of that contrast that was in the first shot and squashing it towards the middle. Now, that has a bonus because it means that we can see the detail in these highlights. So let's have a look out here at these street lights. Here, look, look at all that extra detail. Great stuff. So I can see now all the, the bulbs and the, um, all of the, the traffic trails along here. In the original, I couldn't. And part of that reason is because you've got all of this HDR um, addition in there. So there's before, there's after this particular layer. Now, some of it had already been done on previous layers. So there's before, there's after, without that layer included so let's have a look at everything else uh where were we the city i think it is and you've already got highlights in there at minus 67 so if i were to turn that off you can see in here it's a it's a bit brighter still and you know, i think there was another one somewhere riverbank buildings or something yeah so this same one again again highlights down by 51 now think about this on this building here just this building we have reduced the highlights by 51 and another 67 on top of the 51 and it's not just additive it's it's a factor of and on our final one i hope this is the last one but of minus 100 we are reducing those highlights by huge amounts each time and at a certain point Capture One doesn't have any more highlight data in the raw to be able to pull down. So it starts, frankly, inventing detail. Because just like with shadows, you know, if you've got enough data in the shadows and you pull it up, you get detail in the shadows. If you keep pushing it too far and you keep telling Capture One, no, give me more, give me more, what you're now going to be pulling up is noise. So 
absolutely pull it up to within the realms of your camera's ability but don't push it too far um, otherwise you can introduce some artifacts same with highlights so what happens is at a certain point we don't get any more detail i'm just going to be very very zoomed in for a second in this bit here this is still overexposed i cannot pull back any detail in here so even though now let's just undo this one um and where are we riverbank buildings and city so we started off with this overexposed there's our exposure warning up here that's turned on so it was overexposed absolutely and that's obvious that it is overexposed so let's just turn that off there's no detail in here let's turn on our city layer great it's brought some back riverbank buildings brought a bit more back pop the image turn my mask off brought a bit more back it's now not in theory overexposed my pink blob has gone but i have no more detail in here so that hasn't actually helped me all we're doing now is starting to introduce artifacts and by artifacts what i mean is look at these halos around here so you see these bright spots here around every dark line that's when we've overdone HDR. And if I started turning off these HDR layers, look, the halos have gone. So especially look at this doorway over here. I'm going to zoom way in. This is a natural doorway here. As I really pop it, we get all of these extra artifacts, which are horrible when printed. That's the thing to be careful with. So we don't want to push that HDR so far that we introduce artifacts we don't want and a complete flattening of the image. So while I get the tendency to have this sort of, you know, pop the image um, layer, I, I get it. Let's back this away. Just to there. To me, that just feels like a much more calm and, and realistic image. Let's just uh, clone this a second. And we'll do that on one of them. So around about 40. If I want the image to pop a bit more in terms of brightness, well, let's use that brightness a bit more than before. Because that's not going to... Remember, that's moving everything a little bit. So that's not going to give us that um, disparity. But if I now look from this image here, which is our flattened HDR version, to this here... This one just looks so much more real and natural. Um, and if I just zoom in over here on these buildings, look at that difference between here where the HDR is overdone and here where we've backed it off by quite a way. Not completely, but we have backed it off. Um, and it just feels more natural as a city shot. We don't have those, those weird highlights and, and halos around everything that we didn't want. So, you know, in answer to the question, I guess, you know, how, you know, can we make this pop? Yeah, we can, but don't make it pop too much. Um, be a bit careful. The other thing I would do on here is maybe back away these chimneys here. Um, you've already got a layer on the left. I think it was here. Um, so you've, you've got a layer in here which is less blue dominance. So I believe somewhere there is a, there's a change somewhere. Maybe it's in the uh, white balance. But to me, I'm not sure exactly where that change is, actually. But hmm, strange. But to me, I'm almost tempted to pull that exposure down there a little bit too. Just so that the eye isn't even drawn to them. I, I get the, the, the issue of trying to reduce the blue. Actually, if we want to reduce the blue, then let's go into our color editor, go to our blues, and reduce the saturation. So we get a much, uh, much more muted tone in here. But that then brings the eye up to the city rather than this sort of boom. Um, everything is everything is bright, everything is sharp, everything is detailed. Um, that's one for me that um, I'd, I'd just be just be careful of um, that we're not trying to, and again, not trying to pull up the details in everything. Because if you bring up the details in everything, the eye can be confused as to where you want me to look. Um, so that's where I'd leave it. Not much of a change, to be honest, um, Shields. So I would literally back this layer away a little bit, down to 40% rather than 100. Um, and on your chimneys one, just go into the color editor, pick on the blue and just desaturate it a little bit and then bring down a little bit of brightness, you know, half a stop as that is, just so that we're not distracted by them, um, just so they're not quite so dominant uh, in the, the portal that we have. 
Right. Uh, Bob, I think, next. A picture of some ice on a waterfall from, from looking at it. Um, and it, the question that, that Bob had was about um, the uh, black and white conversion. So here is our original picture. Very blue. Um, here is the black and white conversion and the crop um, that Bob's chosen. The black and white conversion, um, for those of you that don't know, when you do a black and white conversion, you have access to this panel down here, which allows you to change how um, the black and white conversion reacts to different colors. So if you've got a red and you want that to be brighter, or you know, in, in black and white terms, if you want the sky to turn dark, almost towards the black end of, of the histogram, um, you pull down the blues. So you pull down the cyans and the, the blues. So effectively, the black and white conversion itself darkens the sky. That's one other use for it. But here's the problem. Let's go on to... Um, let's use Marcos, for example, um, just for a second. Sorry, Marco, I'm borrowing your image. Um, let's go on to our color tab. I'm going to go on to background for this. I'm going to enable black and white. Now, remember, we had some red fields. We have some green fields and some blue stuff here as well. Enable black and white. Let's take our red fields and darken them and lighten them and darken them and lighten them. So we can see we've got control over the red. Great. Let's take some of the blue stuff that was there. Let's uh, darken, lighten. Let's go with darker there. The real deep blues, let's darken them. The trail, the greens, let's maybe lighten those a little bit. So all the fields. The yellows, let's pull those down. You get what I'm doing. So effectively, we're using the data that was in the color image to control that conversion into black and white as to what element should be brighter and what element should be darker. So you're probably going to guess the issue with Bob's shot. It's all blue. So let's go into our black and white conversion here and what Bob's done is he's pulled down blue and pulled up cyan but let's take red for example there's a little bit of change somewhere uh, maybe up here in some of these reflections um, but not a lot not much is happening it may be picking up in here so the red channel pretty dead the yellow channel doing nothing the green channel doing nothing magenta channel oh that one's actually doing a little bit yeah and that comes from the fact that within magenta obviously you've got elements of, um, of blue in there too um, so the blue content in the original shot has it gets affected by the magenta filter um, because this does include some of that color um, that's in there but other than this main blue one which obviously has a dramatic effect on it let's just pull that back here so the blue on its own is going to go brighter to darker. I would challenge that actually you could have done the same just almost using the exposure tool or the, the brightness tool because that's effectively what we're doing. The whole image is blue. So if I start using the blue filter in black and white, all I'm doing is changing the brightness and the darkness of the whole image. So... If that's the case, maybe the the color ranges in our conversion isn't the best place to start. And what I tend to do uh, in terms of how we apply any color conversion, I actually quite often start with the preset styles in here. Um, the ones that say built in under IQ style. So IQ is phase one's um, digital backs. And let me just reset this. And I'm going to go into these two and consider which one is going to be more um, exciting to start with, I guess. And to me, it's black and white contrast. So this is a style that's alike uh, an achromatic digital back. So with that style in there, what it does do is it's already loaded in a preset style that I can now start from. So I can still now apply, if I wanted to, that blue filter. But we're starting from a base position of a higher contrast image um, with a lot more um, information. So we've got this, this Luma curve that's built in there um, to begin our edit with. So with that style used as the beginning, this black and white contrast one, I could then, for example, play with levels. So we can bring our brights up here. But look at all this detail here I'm keeping. If I go to here, 
this has started to become a bit sort of overdose. It's a bit too crisp, as it were. This is a bit more natural to start with. That's fine. But then we can pull up our brightness a touch. If you do want it to pop a bit more, I am going to use clarity. That's going to get a lot of the texture back. But whenever we start talking about texture, structure is a great partner for clarity. Don't push it too far. Let's just have a little look into here. If we push structure too far, you get too much of this crisping um, that happens. But let's just push it maybe up to sort of 20s and 30s, somewhere like that. And we can do a before and after on just this tool. So that's without, that's with. But here's the key thing. Starting from that style, this one here, which is baked in by the um, the image professor guys um, in, in Copenhagen, and then adjusting um, your other tools, you can get to a much more detailed and cleaner place. So if we look in here, all this detail that's inside, in here it's sort of gone. And that's because we pulled that blue slider down to try and get contrast. Well, maybe we start with a curve, like in this case. You've still got the same amount of contrast, but we haven't lost any of the detail. Um, in terms of crop, um, I don't know, if I'm honest, Bob, whether you wanted a square crop. Um, if you did, then um, you know that, that crop is fine. My personal view is I would be tempted to go a bit more landscape with it because I like all of these shapes and you know bumps and lumps and all that sort of stuff. That That works really well. So... Again, whether it's two by one or whether it's a two by three, maybe we go uh, panoramic. Um, let's pull this in. Uh, maybe uh, we probably want this bottom part in, so maybe we do stick with the two by three. Pull up from here. And I want some context in here. So, person, and again, this is personal view. I'd be in that place. These things get a bit distracting then, obviously, but as a result of quite a few versions ago now, the healing brush in Capture One is really, really powerful. So let's just heal that one out. And we're going to take that source from here. Oh, actually, maybe it guessed it better in the first place. Yeah. Should have not done anything and just let it get on with it. <laughs> That's quite often the case now. So Capture One's clever enough to be able to fix some of this stuff. Let me just undo that heel and try try again and leave it alone. Um, so make sure that you've got 100% whenever you're on the healing brush. And we're just going to draw that line down there. And there we go. Let's let Capture One guess it and sort itself out. So that one gone. This one gone. A little bit more there. Good. And this one down here just to keep it clean. So that's our heel there. Um, our base changes have been done in the background. Another thing to bear in mind, the reason that I've done that on the background is your styles when they involve black and white and your sliders for black and white will only work on the background. If I create a new layer, um, you can apply those sliders, but it's going to have some, some weird results if you do it um, on a separate layer, especially when you start playing with white balances and stuff like that. So if you've got a style that wants to add black and white, typically it's going to do that stuff to the background. Let it do that um, rather than trying to, to override it later on with another layer. Uh, where are we? One question from Keith. I've heard some people say that correct your image while in color and then convert to black and white to get an overall black and white or better black and white image. I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, you know, I honestly don't think that, that's, that there's anything wrong with doing it that way. You, my argument would always be, especially with a conversion to black and white, there's nothing more annoying than realizing when you've done all the work in black and white that actually you'd like a color version. So my argument then would be kind of along those lines. Do it in color. Do it with all the data you've got. Then do the conversion last, just in case you don't like it in black and white afterwards. You might prefer it in color when you're finished. So... That's that's my reasoning for it, but yeah, whether it's a better result, I'm not I'm not sure. Healing will work the same whether it's black and white or not. Um, yeah, I, I'm not so sure. Uh, where are we? Joe's just said uh, maybe adding a bit more contrast potentially. Yeah, so if I were to add a traditional brush, not a magic brush, we don't have to use magic brush for everything now. <laughs> we can just stick with the old ones. Um, I'm just gonna add a little bit of extra texture more than anything maybe not necessarily contrast but just in these sort of icicles here 
let's use the contrast to touch but more importantly I'm going to up that clarity a little bit too um, and we may pull down that highlight but that allows me to bring up some brightness so that's my extra layer from there to there um, if I don't like some of the effects on the outside I can obviously erase them but I get to there and it's just you know from there I think my gut feel is it's a bit too harsh uh, if I'm honest Bob it, it because I've I, because I can see what was there originally and I, I like seeing this sort of detail in there but again that's personal preference um, if you preferred it to be harsher then you know, use those levels even more and bring it to the forefront but yeah that's that's your choice so um, that's probably it for us today and um, we'll get to other images next time so we've got Nars images and Venugopalan's image as well um, we'll get to those uh, next week but for now we've got that one um, Bob's ice shot uh, we've got Marco's big field um, you know and again it's a good conversion I wouldn't um, I wouldn't criticize that it's just for me I'd, I'd prefer the crop slightly differently Geo City, you know, don't overdo those sliders. Let's let's keep it real as a as a cityscape should be. Um, and Chris's original um, rock shot there. And my plea, and it is a plea, um, don't be one of the mad old ranters. Um, if you, there's something in a version update that you don't like with Capture One, put it into the support site. You know, put in the suggestions. Put in what would be better. Put in what would uh, what would work. And don't just think of your own workflow because. No one is going to design a piece of software for you in isolation. Well, they can, but you'd love to see the bill for it. Um, you've got to think bigger than that about how other users are using it too. And of course, I do too. So I understand the frustration that some people have with some of the changes that happen in software. Um, just be careful that we're not looking at things blinkered um, and, and make the suggestions, make the positive changes and the positive words. Um, to try and get the, the solution in the way that helps you but also helps other people. Um, that's the key thing. So that's it for now. Um, we'll be back next week. Um, who noticed this is round? It's all fancy and round now. Um, so we're back next week. Uh, in the meantime, carry on um, that discussion from today or whatever um, in our uh, Facebook group. Uh, there are of course the YouTube pro tips things in there is the full guide that we did last week to 14.3 so it covers all of the new tools and the changes in there as well so you can go and um, watch that one and between now and then if you want your image to be looked at and played with then send it in with WeTransfer please include your name if you don't include your name we will not include your image it's that simple um, so poreforlive.wetransfer.com send them in um, we'll see what we can get to next week but between now and then, um, hopefully, you're carrying on editing stuff. Um, put in your feature suggestions, please. You know, Use that support.captureone.com. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone is busy doing that um, instead of ranting and yelling on keyboards instead. Right. We will catch you in a week's time. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.